Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, Cole? Mm-hmm. You good, dude, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, man. Good. What's up, Appreciate boss? You, Last time I seen you, was, shit, 20, 30 years yeah, ago in, uh, in Nassau. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Ty Lue close. I, I might be able to back him down. Uh, I, I might be able to. That's my best friend. You might be able to go around here. <laughs> <laughs> I might be able to back him down, Chad. Moss in the house. Where am I sitting at? Right here? Right there. Man, look. See? God, you made it to the big time. So. <laughs> I told y'all, this basketball is different, man. <laughs> basketball Chad, yeah. different. Yeah, it's a little different. Basketball yeah, a little different. different, Chad. Yeah, Look at you. We got, we got two, two of y'all. We took over the world, baby. <laughs> Cole, when Barack and Oak, when Barack, Barack and, and Drake. And Drake. Yeah, when they hit it, it was over. It was over. <laughs> <laughs> it was over. I started walking different yeah. in the mall. <laughs> <laughs> we here. <hit> yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hey, you see him up there somewhere. Somewhere hey, around cut it there. Up. Cut it out. You know that ain't never happened. Boy, it's, it's bad just... on me in the mall now. Ladies at Chick fil A's. <laughs> hey, my non Mary thing. Right. <laughs> so, because you thought when she said my pleasure, she meant she wanted to holler at you. They say that at every Chick fil A, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's different when they look at me in the eyes, D. <laughs> What's up, Coach, man? No. We appreciate you sitting down with us. No, nah, uh, no problem. I know during the season, uh, you got a lot of work to do. They're, they were explaining to me y'all work days and you know, how much goes into each and every day. Them boys say, Coach, they don't know when the weekend is. No, they don't, they don't get, especially guys in the video room, they never get days off, you know, and so they kind of keep everything going just from, you know, breaking down film, um, the scouts for the next teams and next games, and so they're here every day. Like, they don't never, really, never get a day off unless we say, you know, today is a blackout day. Nobody comes in, <laughs> and so most of the time they still come in anyway, but they, they work hard. They, they do all the grunt work, you know what I mean? Hold up. Limitless. Biggest to me, God pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Biggest to me, God pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, it's it's a, a big moment for us. This is our first NBA head coach. We got Channing, Freddie T. I'm RC. Thank you to everybody that supports the show. For everybody that's been pushing us to our partners, Happy Dad, to our sponsors, DraftKings, we, we appreciate you. Coach, I, I have a question. I know it would be a crazy thing if we said, hey, yeah, this guy made it to the league from Mexico. And they would be like, oh, he Mexican? No, he's from Mexico, Missouri. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about trying to achieve this dream, but being in a place in a city where they where there's not a lot of cats to look up to that have made it from Mexico? It was tough. You know, I think, you know, growing up in a small town, 11,000 people, um, and only 1,100 black people. And so um, when you come from a small town, um, you know, when somebody dies, everyone's affected because you know everybody in the community. But it just was, it was tough because not a lot of scouts are coming in watching, you know, high school games for our school. Not a lot of talk about you know the players around that that small town because our small town they're going to play well. If you have them twenty five or thirty, like oh, what's a small town? They're two A or three yeah. A. It's not the big class, and so it, it's hard. You know, it's hard, and so it's not a lot of guys to look up to. You know, for our younger youth and our, our younger kids. And when I was younger, it wasn't a lot of people to look up to. You know, I had to move to Kansas City my sophomore year in high school, where I moved in with my uncle Kevin Graves and. Um, I was able to start getting recruited, start being seen by more colleges, and I played my first AAU uh, on my first AAU team when I got in 11th grade, you know, and Dang. so we didn't have that in Mexico. We didn't have AAU teams. We wasn't traveling. We didn't have a budget or money to do that, and so I didn't even know what it was until I moved to Kansas City <laughs> and kind of like saw what it was all about, about traveling and first time being on the airplane, um, my junior year going into my senior year, and so it was a big difference. It was a big jump and going from a small town to a big city like Kansas City. Um, it was a huge jump for me, you know, but it was a jump I needed to take, like I said, if I wanted to get to where I wanted to get to. And um, I thought I had the talent. I really didn't know, but I thought I had the talent. But until you play against, you know, inner city kids and guys yeah. that are, you know, six, eight, six, nine, seven foot, we played against all small guys in my yeah. town. So until you actually see that and actually play, um, you really don't know how good you are. And so um, I needed to take that jump and take that leap. And it was hard for me to leave my family and my mom. And it was a tough situation. but. Um, it all panned out. It's, it's better for the whole family now that I did make that move. That story usually ends different. That guy in the small town that balls out and whoops the hell out of all the little kids around <laughs> yeah. the area. Usually 20 years later, he's working at the pumping stop right. <laughs> down the road telling those stories. What yes. made you different as a player, as a champion, a coach, as a champion? Yeah. You come from that, and now you're doing something because you just talked about the head coaches, 
but also a championship player. How did how, how did you become that from Mexico, Missouri? I think it's my upbringing. And in Mexico, when you're from a small town, um, everybody has a hand in raising you. You know, it's not just your parents, it's not your mom, your grandma, your grandpa. Like, everyone has a hand in raising you and trying to get you to where you want to get to. And because I ran with the wrong crowd sometimes, you know, we all, we've all done that. But then I had some, some great guys who were part of the wrong crowd but taught me a lot. Like, listen, you're not going this route. Like, you're one of the guys that can actually make it. Like, mm -hmm. so we're going to protect you. We're going to do everything we can to keep you away from this life so you can go ahead and further your life and do the right thing. And so just instilling that in me, I think from the older guys that taught me that, and then my mom, you know, my grandma, my grandpa, my uncles and aunties and family around me who taught me that, um, it helped to go a long way. And I wasn't perfect, you know, but yeah. I never had a drink in my life. I've never had a smoke in my life. Never tried it, you know, but... Just like you, Chan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never his name is Chan <laughs> <laughs> now so the de decisions I've made you know in my life I was always prepared I always knew what I was doing I never was altered in any kind of way and not saying that you know drinking so you do what you want but I just never did that and so that helped me along the way as well too you spoke about not being on the AAU until your junior year we had T-Mac on the show and he broke down his old experience you know when he started playing basketball and getting to the AAU and wanting to go after the best guys there mm -hmm. to show that he was ready for that. In this environment now, fast forward, I guess, 20, 30 years since you've been there, right. uh, from a budget standpoint and having the money to be able to do that, can guys achieve the next level of success without having the notoriety of being on AAU programs? I think, uh, I think so because, like, it's so much social media now. So, you, like, you and I have heard of a guy and you look and it's like, you know, a million views of a guy jumping over somebody dunking. Like, so you don't really need the same play. Like, when I when I came out through AAU, like, we heard of guys like Chauncey Billups, but you never knew what he looked like. Okay. Like, you heard of Stephon Marbury or right. Ron Mercer, but you'd be like, you go to the gym, like, man, which one's Chauncey? Oh, it's the guy with the part in the middle of his head with the, mm. but you didn't know what he looked like. But like, nowadays, you can just click on social media, you can see everything you want to see. And so, Today, I don't think AAU is as important as it was back when we were coming up, but it's still a big platform as well. Right, and you mentioned the, the social media play, and these guys are almost crowned before they actually get out there and do their thing. Do those players really got it? Like, do they really have it? Or is it just, you know, they just create this following because maybe they're cool or fashionable or, you know, they seem like they can be the next guy. Do they really have it? I think a lot of them have it, but I think also a lot of them they get a lot of things, so they're giving a lot. Like when we came up, you know, you, you had to grind all the way school. through. Right. But now you're in eighth grade, they take you, no, you're gonna go to private school, we're gonna protect you. You got your own shoes, your car. Like we didn't have all that growing up, you know what I mean? So I think now once you, they say, okay, he's six, eight in the eighth grade, oh, he's a pro. So we're gonna take mm -hmm. him, we're gonna protect him, we're gonna do everything we wanna do to try to make sure he becomes this next prospect. And so I think those kids kind of like, they lose a, a lot of their hunger because right. like they get everything. You're giving them everything from eighth grade on through, mm -hmm. where we had to grind from fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, right. ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. And so that, that could be a big difference as well. Makes sense. You mentioned your uncles earlier. Your uncle Jay said he realized you had talent because you could suck your thumb and dribble <laughs> a basketball uh, <laughs> at the same time and then not get taken away. And the, the type of hunger from going from Mexico to KC, then now Nebraska, and then drafted by the Nuggets, traded to the Lakers. When you finally get to that point and you say, okay, the kid from the small town who had to make a tough decision in high school to go live with his uncle makes it to the NBA. What was that moment like for you? And you were stepping into a team with Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. So actually, I was at my agent's house in New York, Andy Miller. I got drafted, you know, said 23rd, 23rd pick, yeah. you know, Denver Nuggets select Teron Lou. And like, it just felt unreal. Like it was, it was crazy. And I, I kind of was in shock because to see a name called by David Stern, like you never thought that day would come. And it was, it was actually here. 10 minutes later, said so I've been traded to the Lakers. I jumped up on the couch, I'm going crazy. I was <laughs> jumping over and my agent killed my heart, right? Like, oh, now this changes everything. You go into a class A organization. You could be out of league in three years if you don't. I got now I went from a high to scared <laughs> to death. Like, man, like, damn, like you just took, <laughs> I'm getting drafted tonight and 10 minutes later, I'm scared to death, right. you know? And so he kind of blew my high with that. But, um, you know, for me, it was like a dream come true. You know, I put the work in, I was dedicated to the game. Um, had a lot of help along the way, like I said, family, friends, Mexico, you know, who raised me. And um, I just wanted to get to the point where I can take care of my family, my mom, my grandmother, my sister, brothers, aunties, uncles. 
And when I got drafted, you know, um, my mom and grandma, they ain't worked another day in their life. They begin to check for 25 years every month. Like, you know, That's so. A blessing. Yeah. And so that was a blessing for me to be able to take care of them and to see where we come from and all the struggles we had, you know, being poor and being raised and everything they had to do to try to get everything that we wanted. And so um, my grandma, my mom, man, like, she, I mean, they could have anything. And so I know coming to the league, I'm my financial advisor, like, man, you give a lot of money to your family. I said, man, I'd rather be broke. I don't want to be rich and my family be broke. Right. I'd rather be broke as long as they're successful and as long as they're happy, then I'm okay. You know, and so that's kind of like how I live my life. Not to this day now. Yeah. Still giving away money? Yeah. Why? They had to find something to do with nah, the money you gave nah. them. They did a lot they of raising. They invest it. or invest do something to <laughs> nah. capitalize. No, nah, I'm just saying, if you just see all the things they did for me to get to this point, yeah. I mean, and I owe them everything. Yeah, and so, yeah. I mean, I made a lot of money and I'm, I'm secure, you yeah. know, with my money and everything. So... Um, not having any kids or nothing like that, so it goes to my family. I wanted to ask too. You talking about just you getting to LA and that first class organization? A guy you just were able to rent a car, and now you're playing with Kobe Bryant and Shaq. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. But how, how was that like for a young dude walking? You just back up and just be a fly on the wall, or do you have to purposely prove yourself to a guy like that? I think the biggest thing that helped me was when I first got to LA. Um, I had a chance. To, I uh, met Nick Van Exel, who I got traded for. Um, I actually lived in his apartment uh, when we got here, and it was right next door to Eddie Jones. And so Eddie Jones took me under his wing and like kind of showed me the ropes and taught me everything. And so the first week I got in town, um, he took me to the Century Club. And uh, I went to the Century Club, and I met Shaq like the first night. And so Shaq was like, man, glad to have you. Whatever. Come to the house tomorrow. I'm going to have a big you know, meal, whatever, whatever. And so we go over to Shaq's house the next day. He gives me, uh, I think, $20,000 cash. Like, I know you ain't got no money. I know it's a lockout. You know, take care of yourself. You know, fed us well. And then that kind of helped me out because I would have been at all. You know, like, I don't know what's, what I would have expected if I just walked into practice and seen yeah. Shaq and Kobe, you know. Yeah. And so um, Shaq just made me feel welcome right away. You know, the first, the first time I met him, and it kind of, you know, went on from there. Did you pay him back? No, he didn't. He said he didn't want it back. You know what I'm <laughs> it was a lockout. I got half my money. Like yeah. it was, oh, it was crazy. Yeah, it was. It was a struggle that first year or two. But you know, I finally got it together. So, a as a player coming in to a prestigious organization like the Lakers, like how do players defer to the superstar players on the team? I understand you have to find yourself a role. Is it challenging to fit into that spot? Yeah, it is challenging. I think. Everyone that comes from college and goes to the NFL, goes to the you know NBA, you probably were the man on your team. Mm -hmm. And so you used to, you know, I averaged 23 points a game in college, and so you used to shooting the ball whenever you want to. But I would come into practice and play great, you know, every day and not see the floor. Like I was yeah. in a suit the first 35 games of the season, and I might understand like, damn, like I'm playing good, I'm balling, but now I got to find other ways to get on the floor. Mm -hmm. And so it ain't gonna be my offense. Like we got Eddie Jones, we had Glenn Rice, we had Kobe, we had Shaq, Rick Fox. So what can I do different? What can I bring different to get on the floor? And that was, you know, picking up full court, being a yeah. defensive player, and um, which I never did in college or <laughs> high school, but I was like, right. you know, I got to get on the floor. Yeah. Like, so I started picking up full court, and I became like a defensive player, which I never was that throughout my career, like as far as high school and college. But it changed my career as far as, you know, going against AI and everybody talking about the step over and all that stuff. But, like, he made my career. If it wasn't for AI, like, I don't know where I would be because that challenge, like, helped me get my next contract, and it allowed me to stay in the league for 11 years. Explain that. You said he made your career. The step over, I mean, everybody. Because Doug seen Collins it. made it too big of a deal. Yeah, he I did. Was, I'm a huge, I was yeah. a huge Laker fan. Yeah. I was hot. <laughs> and, and Doug was my coach. So when, after that step over, I signed with the Wizards right. that same summer. <laughs> like, Doug, he, he was the head coach. Right. But to me, it wasn't like, they act like he crossed me over, I fell down, he stepped up. <laughs> like, he made a shot, I contested it. And then I stepped on his foot and fell down. He stepped over me. But they made it like, oh, he crossed him over and all that. But to me, if Toronto would have won that series instead of Philly, and it was been Vince Carter and Alvin Williams as a 6'4 mm, yeah. point guard, like, I probably wouldn't have seen the floor. Like, I would have I never got on the floor because we had Brian Shaw and Kobe and Ron Harper. We had all those big guards, which Alvin Williams posted up. He was a big guard. So if it wasn't for AI making it to the finals, you would never probably never seen T. Lou. You know, and so – that's why I always say, like, you know, by him making it to the finals and me having a chance to guard him in the finals, that helped my career out. Do you not wish you ain't try to kick him? I wish I would have picked him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, the, the, the yeah. picture, man, because you sitting there like, mm, yeah, yeah. and he cocky like, right. bitch, get the fuck yeah. off of my And that's my guy, too, now, yeah. you know what I mean? But 
Like, if I had known, like, what it was going to be, if I saw it, like, three years happened, three years before to somebody else, I'd have picked him up. Like, no, nah, we ain't doing this. Like, <laughs> like I might have set him down, but we ain't doing yeah. this. But I didn't think it was a big deal until yeah. Doug called, oh, and he steps up. Man, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, so, yeah. What's funny about it, though, like, you've been on record now saying that even though AI was close to you in age, he was somebody you looked up to. So when you do get that call, because like I always make the joke about Michael Jordan, LeBron, Kobe, when y'all go through y'all shoot around and they telling y'all who y'all got, they're like, yeah, you're going to stick 23. Right. And I'll be like, hell no, say his name. His name Michael Jordan. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? Yeah. When, when you get that assignment in that type of moment, is what is your thought? Is your thought, okay, if I go out and play well, it does get me my next contract? Or are you kind of feeling like, all right now, like it's on, it's on national TV? What's well, a lot that goes into it. So... <laughs> When I was playing and Phil Jackson was coaching with the Lakers or whatever, when I was with the Lakers, you know, you got to be put on the playoff roster where you can't play the whole playoffs. And so, like, now you can just – you can rotate every game. But, like, back then, it's a playoff roster and it's set. So we, we go to the war room, and I had been going back and forth with Mike Pinberg. Like, I'm, I wasn't sure if I was going to be on the playoff roster or J.R. Ryder was going to be on the playoff roster. And so it was crazy. So we sitting in the war room. I'm like, man, I'm praying, like, man, please let me be on this month, you know what I'm saying? And so we sitting there, Phil goes down the list, goes down the list, and he says my name. And I jump up and go crazy. Kobe goes crazy, Shaq, B. Shaw, like, I go crazy, right? Everybody's happy for me. Um, and so that was, the, that was the, first, the first challenge, like, getting on the playoff roster. Because I, if I would have got left off, we could have – six people could have got hurt, and you still can't be on the playoff roster. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. that, that, was the, that was the first step. And then the second step for me was like, okay – um, the first round we played, I think San Antonio maybe, we played good. I played like eight minutes a game or ten minutes a game. When we got to the finals, I, I wasn't even playing. So the first half, I didn't play at all. And AI, I think, had like 36 points yeah, at crazy. halftime or something crazy. And then six minutes ago in the third quarter, Phil looked down. I was sitting on the floor. Me and Devin George, he looked down and said, Luby, let's go. I'm like, what? <laughs> I jumped up, so I didn't have time to really think about it. I didn't right. think I was going to play. you know. Yeah. So I jump up, and I'm just like, man, it's, it's a guy I idolized, like, you know, like some of the same upbringings, same heights, you know, corn, yeah. like everything. Like, and he was somebody that I idolized, like growing, even though he's only two years older than me, like I looked up to him the way he played, the style of play. And um, given my opportunity, like I knew every move, like I worked on that. Everything he did, like I knew his counters, I knew what he was gonna do, if he's gonna snatch back, if he's gonna, you know, spin. I knew everything. And mm -hmm. so just study him every day for two weeks and then finally get my chance to get out there and play against him, like it was like a dream come true. So I didn't have time to be scared or shook or none of that. I was just up for the challenge. Well, I'm telling you what, the whole week, I used to know Randy Moss was on the other side, and I was scared as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't even gonna lie. I was like, hey, yeah. Troy, you got to come over here too now. Right, we both right, need right, to be right. here. Coach, when you win early, as you guys did, you win in 2000, you win in 01, do you have the feeling at that point, man, you know, winning championships is pretty cool. It's pretty easy. Like, like we're going to do this, and then you go throughout your career, you play for different teams, and you never get an opportunity to be in that spot again. Is there any part of, of your career that you regret not taking advantage of or not doing in order to put yourself back in that position? I try not to live with regrets. You know, um, my contract was up, and so they offered me a one-year deal to come back, and I had a better deal in Washington. And so I thought, like, okay, I won two championships. Now it's a chance for me to, like, get paid and get some money and have an opportunity to play with Michael Jordan. You know, and so um, you get a chance to play with the GOAT. Like, you got to you gotta take that swing, you know. And so um, for me, like I said, I won two championships. Now I can go to Washington, play with Michael Jordan, get paid, the biggest deal I've had since I've been in the league. I have to do it. And I had a lot of guys I talked to. Brian Shaw was a great mentor, Rick Fox, Robert Ory. Um, and those guys like, listen, man, I know you want to be in L.A. I know you love the team, but you got to take care of your family. If that's what you really want to do, like, you got to take this next step. And so um, that's that's what I had to do. And like I said, I don't regret playing with Michael Jordan. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't regret my 11-year NBA career. And so um, I really don't regret it, no. And now maybe the 24-year-old Tyloo wouldn't couldn't answer this question because he was too close to it. But you play on, what, nine Eight, nine, ten? Seven, eight, yeah, yeah. In like 11 years. Why was that? Because you were a hell of a player. We all knew you. Yeah. We all loved you. But you were jumping from team to team. Nobody was giving you that big deal. Well, for me, I think I got traded three times out of it. But a lot of times I was a free agent. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was just a role player. So yeah. back then you signed in two-year deals. And so now I either come back with the same team or go get more money. And I think... You know, while I won early, I was like, you know what? I got to chase this money because I don't know how long my career is going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't a, a marquee name or a marquee player, so I got I to gotta get the money. 
you know, and so um, that's kind of how I looked at it. And so, and I like change too. Like I don't oh, like being yeah. in the same spot, same every. I, I, I like change. And so, um, like I said, Lakers came up. I was a free agent. I left, went to the Wizards. My two years up with the Wizards, I was a free agent. I left and went to, I think, uh, Orlando. You know, then I got traded from Orlando to Houston, mm -hmm. and then from Houston to Atlanta. That was all in the same year, so I really don't count. Yeah. And then in Atlanta, I was there for four years, and then I got traded to Sacramento, and then it was kind of like, you know, it was what it was. After that, I was probably done anyway. So yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, those are decisions you have to make, and you got to be able to live with them. And so when you're a, a guy like me and my caliber player, like you're getting two-year deals, so it's gonna be changed every two mm -hmm. years, you know. Yeah. And so, and I was okay with that. You don't think you ever worked yourself into a player that wasn't just a role player? No. No, yeah, I mean, could I just, you honestly say that? Could you say that back then? Yeah, I, I knew who I was. Man. Yeah, and so I, I mean, I've always been a team guy, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I got to um, Milwaukee my last year before I got traded to Orlando halfway through the season, which is one of the the best coaches I played for as well, Scott Skiles. And so, you know, I was 32, you know, 11 years in the league my last year, and it'd be times where like Ramon Sessions, and uh, were like he'd be the starter, and uh, Luke Rittenauer, and so it'd be like games we're getting blown out, and so. It might be a minute into the game. I mean, a minute left in the game, and he wouldn't put me in. And so we was talking one day after the game. I was like, he's like, you know, I, you know, I respect you, and you know, I wouldn't want to put you in the end. I said, man, you can put me in with 10 seconds. I'm going to mm -hmm. run my ass up there, and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Like, yeah. I, I know who I am. Yeah. It's, it's never been an ego with me. It's about winning. It's about the team. And so I've never had a problem. I didn't even play with Scott Skiles that much. Stan Van Gundy in Orlando when I got traded there, I didn't play. But I thought he was a great coach. Like, mm -hmm. Some people are like, oh, I don't play, forget that. Like, no, it ain't about that. And so um, for me, I was always an ultimate team guy. Like, I go out there, I was a starter in Atlanta. I go out there and rebound for the guy that ain't even playing. Like, that's just who I was. I was never a star player or that player that, like, you know what, we got to keep him. No. Yeah. That unselfishness and, honestly, the ability to adjust to change can help in the coaching room, right? Yeah. Because you can bounce around, do different jobs, be in different cities, but... Uh, I think it was Doc Rivers who encouraged you to become a coach. When you're thinking about that transition, what were your thoughts in going to, into coaching, and was there any hesitancy in making that decision? So I played for Doc in uh, 2003 um, in Orlando. So I mean, he ended up getting fired, but he always told me he said, um, "You know, when you're done playing, you can come coach with me." I was like, "Man, you crazy? I ain't coaching. Like, I've only been in the league four or five years. I'm like, man, I ain't coaching. Like, I don't want to do that." And so he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And so um, in 2009, you know, my last year, I was done playing. And I was like, okay, I can go overseas and play or I can do something different. And so I was like, I really don't want to go overseas. Like, you know, I'm done. And so I called Doc. I said, you know what? I want to try this coaching thing. And um, Doc said, okay, uh, I'll call you back in two days. And I'll let you know. So usually I'm like, yeah, right. He ain't going to call back. Call back the next day. You know, him and Danny Ainge both. And um they um, gave me a spot, and I was like, you know what? Start out player development, see if you like it, see right. if you want to do this. Um, and the first year and a half, two years, he kind of like let me get the player out of me. Like, yeah. okay, do this, see if you like this. And then he started giving me more and more things to do. First it was the defense, then it was the offense, and I just learned so much. And I was like, you know what? I do like this. Mm -hmm. And so um, then that's kind of like how my coaching career started. You see, as soon as he mentioned Doc, though, his voice went to the Jamie Foxx voice. <laughs> yeah, man, you got call. <laughs> Ty, you got it. <laughs> I'm sitting over here, man. I'm just waiting on the opportunity to ask you about your time in Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, we all grew up playing with Mike. Yeah, we got his, his <laughs> shoes on. What was that experience like? You know, we hear other great players, the Larry Birds, say he's God in a uniform. You know, AI saying he could see Mike's aura. As a guy who got an opportunity to see him every single day in practice, what was that experience? It taught me that I was 22 years old, 23 years old, and I didn't work hard enough. Hmm. And, you know, when you're young, you think you're working hard, but until you see people that actually work hard, you don't really know what work is. And um, MJ being 40 years old, you know, we call him Black Jesus. You right. know, but, you know, it's MJ being 40 years old, and he'd be the first guy in the gym. You walk in the gym at, you know, practice at 11, you walk in the gym, you think you're early at 9 o'clock, He's already got a full lather. He's done, done lifted, court workout and everything. I'm like, damn, like what's... And then we come to practice. He's on one leg. Like he, he was hurt the second year. He was on one leg the whole year and played 82 games. Wow. Like, and so he practiced every day and he played every game on one leg. And so you're like, man, MJ, why don't you just sit up? I can't, how can I be the leader of the team and sit out and y'all going through all the credit? I got to be there or I lose my power as being a leader. Like I can't tell you what to do. I'm sitting on the sideline. Like, 
it was like, damn, like this, like he's 40 years old on one leg, the greatest of all time. Right. And you're going to practice every day on one leg at 40 years old. Like, so I'm, I'm not doing enough. And so then he started this thing called the breakfast club. And that's when I actually really started lifting weights. So every morning we would be on the road, we would get together, go lift weights, and then we'd come back, have breakfast, and then we'd go to shooting around. And that kind of taught me, like, got me into lifting weights and all that stuff. But to see a guy 40 years old, and he was, you know, known as the best player ever, and to still practice every day, be the first guy at the gym, and the last guy to leave, like, that just shows you at 23, 24 years old, I wasn't working hard enough. On the other side of that, the guy who gets some of the, the most comparisons outside of LeBron is Kobe. Yeah. You know, uh, what's the difference in, in, in Mike and Kobe? No difference. Their will to win, their will to want to kill you every single night and take your heart, um, their will to miss nine, ten shots in a row and think the next ten are going in. Um, like, just that that killer instinct, like, it just... Those two, I've never seen nothing like it. And, you know, like, Bron is, like, like I said, he's great. And they all, to me, are great players. It's not like, like, you know, whatever, whatever. I don't never compare, do the comparison. Mm -hmm. But those two were spitting images. Like, you know, both 6'6", six, six, yeah. both, you know, with the frame they got, you know, the athletic ability, the mid-post game, um, the passing ability, which they didn't want to pass as much, you know, because right. they want to kill you. Like, I want right. they want to come in the game, I want to get 50 every night. Yeah. That's wow. their mentality. You know, where Bron is, I want to come in and get 30, 10 and 10, you know, whatever, and make, you know, the guys around me better where Kobe and Jordan were like, listen, I want to win, but I want to also kill you and take your heart every single night. Mm -hmm. And so the comparison of those two, just seeing those two, spitting images of each other. Low management. You know, as you've been on the player side and the coaching side now, you mentioned Mike, one leg, 40 years old, want to play 82 games. That's a huge topic of conversation now in your sport, low, low management. How do you handle that as a coach, seeing your players, and also, uh, is it fair, you know, for different guys to make those comparisons with the old school guys and where the game is now? No, the game is different. You know, um, back then, three-point shot, you might shoot 12 threes a game. You know, and now uh, one guy might shoot 12 threes, you know. So the game was totally different. You know, we had a guy that you're going to post every night. You're going to play out the post. You know, we had guys where it was a four and a five. So it's, you know, you swing, swing, cross screen, mm -hmm. the other guy post, you know? So it's like, it wasn't a lot of space on the floor because it wasn't a lot of shooting. Um, but now like teams are shooting 40, 50 threes a game. So the game has just totally changed. It's totally opened up. But as far as the low management goes, you know, it, it's different because like when I came in, it was a lockout year. And so we played 50 games and we played three games in a row, back to back to back. Yeah. You know, I seen Shaq, you know, 300 pounds, like play every game. You know, I seen Kobe, you know, risk and play every game, you know, and so it's just different. And so the times are different. Um, I think the science is really, you know, caught up to really try and take care of our players right. and for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And um, it makes sense to me. So it's got to be a balance. I know it's a lot of compare. Like, well, we played in the old day. We played in Chuck Taylor. We didn't. Right. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's changed. I mean, the game has changed. And, you know, whether we like it or not, um, the science and the data has showed that, you know, doing certain things helps these players in their longevity and getting ready for the end of the season when you go into the playoffs, mm -hmm. like guys are more fresh, guys are healthier. And so I see it both ways, you know, because I played in the old school days and now the new school days, but every, things have changed. One of the greatest coaches ever is, is a huge part of that is Greg Popovich. Greg Popovich was fined, I think, like $250,000 initially when he started to allow guys uh, to low manage. But... You brought me to a point I want to ask you about. You mentioned, obviously, you asked about Kobe and Mike, but also LeBron. LeBron mm -hmm. is part of that conversation, and I believe he's had the greatest career, at least of modern times, that I've got an opportunity to see. January 22nd, 2016, Coach Blatt is fired. You become the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers, and you lead that team to what many believe is the most improbable 3-1 comeback in the finals, everybody talks about the LeBron block. Obviously, Kyrie comes down, hits the three-pointer. That experience for you as a coach, as opposed to a player, how much different was that and what did it mean to you to lead that team there? It was tough. You know, um, I think when you take over midway through a season, you know, we already played 41 games and you take over and you've never done it before. So you always think, you know, mentally like, oh, I can, I can be a head coach, but till you actually slide over one seat, you really don't know. And then come in with no training camp, you know, nothing, and you just take over midway through a season um, for a team that has – expectations of winning a championship, I thought it was tough, you know, and it was it was hard. But when I first walked in that room is I I grabbed Kyrie, K Love, and Braun and I said, listen, 
this is new for me. I'm gonna need you guys help, but this is what I see. It's what I need you guys to do for me. And they had my back 100%. And like I said, they made me better because a lot of things I really didn't know until you actually do it. And I'm learning on the fly. Like, get hired, next day we got a game. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. It's like no practice, no like, and it's so like, like, damn, like, can I really do this? You start questioning yourself, can I really do this? And um, I'll tell you, like, Bron, Kyrie, Caleb, they really kept me on my toes. They really made me a better coach. Like I said, everybody, like, you know, I had a, some success because of, in Cleveland winning a championship, going to four finals or whatever. But I've only been coaching for six years. Yeah. Like, you know, but I've had success early, so people think I've been doing it for a long time. But I really got a lot to learn. Like, I still got a lot to grow, and I understand that. And I'm always willing to learn and work towards that. But that, that was a crazy – it was a crazy year. And uh, to win a championship, like I said, being down 3-1. And I know you talked about my mom and my yeah. grandmother having, you know, cancer, so they couldn't make it to the games. And – and so when we won, everybody, you know, saw the picture on TV. I'm crying. I'm like, it was just like a chance to like exhale. Like it was just so much going on with my family, my mom and grandma. They couldn't be there, winning. You know, all the critics saying that we were dead. We couldn't come. Like it was over. And so it was just a lot. And so when you finally win and able to exhale, it was like a sign of a sigh of relief. You know what I mean? Playing with those stars we're talking about already. And now you said it when you got to Cleveland, you brought up your stars. Yeah. K. Love, Kyrie, LeBron. That was your your big three when you got there. Being a player, and people always want to say, well, people say, you haven't put the cleats on, I don't want to hear your opinion. Right. When they criticize coaches that haven't played. But I do think playing helps you as a coach. Like, to argue that other side, what's, what what does your playing help in the coaching uh, department and dealing with Hall of Famers? Yeah. Like, wh- that whole dynamic. What is what's the difference between you and Tibbs, who didn't play in the league? For me, it's just, like, having that feel. Like, you've been in a locker room, and you know when guys are tired. You know, so like, you know what, we're going to give them a day off or two days off. Or, you know, when you're going through two a days and guys are like, man, no, I've done it. Like, you can't tell. Like, don't try it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've yeah. done it. I've, I've been in two a days for 30 days. <laughs> yeah, not, not for four days. Like, it's not I, like us. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about we play. The yeah. Y'all boys NFL. ain't never been in two a <laughs> days. Y'all did a collective bargain agreement. Y'all going to have four two a days. I did 30 days. Damn. So I, I'm with, you know, Jeff Van Gundy, where, you know, we got 30 other practice, 32 a days. But also on top of that, on days we had like preseason games, we practice in the morning. Like he's like, I don't care about the preseason game. Like we practice, and then play the game at night. So like when they see that, they know you've been through it. They can respect it more. You know, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but they they know like you know what you're talking about. And you can also relate to the players more. You know, because like a guy like Bones Highland, you know, on our team, a really great player. Like we got a lot of guys that you know we're playing. And I got to talk to him. Like man, I've been in your position. Like mm-hmm. like I know what it's about. Like you balling, you playing good. But sometimes you might be able to get on the floor. And so I've been off the bench. I've been a starter. I've been not played. I've been cut. You know, I've been, well, not cut, but I've been traded. Yeah. You know, so I've been in every role you can possibly be in. So when I want to talk to the younger players, like, I've been there. And I've seen it. And I've been a part of it. So they can kind of understand it more. And they listen to you more because you've been through it. How do you manage the, the personalities of your superstars? You know, you got Russ now. You got PG. And then you also have Kawhi. Like, these are superstars. You know, it's not a whole lot of ball to, to go around. How do you manage those personalities? Brian Shaw taught me a long time ago uh, when I was with the Lakers, like with Kobe and Shaq. Like, just, just you know, tell your stars the truth. They might say F you or whatever, but they're going to respect you at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And so I got the relationship where we communicate every day. I, you know, I'm talking with those guys every day, you know, picking their brains, what they like, what they don't like. And my coaching style is like, I want to do what's best for the player that's going to help the team win. And so... You know, what's your what's your best spot on the floor? What you like running in the game? Like, I'm gonna ask you these questions so we can kind of incorporate that into the game. So you you're comfortable when you get the ball in those moments. Like you're comfortable on the floor, and so it's not like one of those things. You do it my way, or you don't like. No, nah, I'm I don't coach like that. And so I want to make sure everybody's comfortable. And then also, if you're comfortable, but make sure we do it in the confines of the other team, and then kind of go from there. And your style of coaching, you you've had some great coaches. Obviously, the legendary Phil Jackson. You mentioned Scott Skiles, uh, Van Gundy, and Doc. Your your philosophy. How much? Who did you steal the most of your coaching style? Everybody. From? Yeah, everybody. <laughs> and so, you know, when I was playing, I didn't really think I was doing that. I didn't really understand it. You know, but like Doc, just um, his ATOs after timeout plays. Like he's the best. You know, I've seen it. Just getting a great shot every time out of timeout. Like execution. Um, Phil Jackson, just being poised on the sideline and do all your coaching in practice and kind of let the guys figure it out. You know, Scott Skiles, um, 
I remember he used to come in the locker room after we lose or win a game and just say, bring it in. And so I find myself doing it all the time. And so I asked Scott Skiles, I was like, why, why do you do that? And he said, well, Ty, what you would know if you ever coach, you know, you can see something like in the game, you might be totally wrong. And <laughs> you like, but you come in the locker room going crazy, cussing guys out, and you look at the film like, damn, it didn't even happen like that. Right. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. after the game, I always find myself, you know, bringing in. And then next day, I do the coaching and do the correcting. And, and so I just took a lot from a lot of different people. And when I was playing, I didn't even know, I didn't even realize I was doing that. In coaching, you are tied to players. And we've mentioned, especially basketball is different. In football, there's not necessarily one player, unless you have Patrick Mahomes that can truly be the reason you win and lose every week. In basketball, if you have a LeBron, you got a shot. Right. You know, you have a healthy Kawhi Leonard, you got a shot. The same way it was with Kobe and all of these players. But LeBron leaves for LA and you've been, you're a coach that's been to all these consecutive NBA championships. You already have a ring and they give you six games, coach, <laughs> and fire you in Cleveland. What was that feeling like for you in saying, I've done all of this, I've accomplished all of these things, and it's six games all I'm worth? No, I think, you know, um, Bron left, you know, Kyrie was gone, and so then we had young guys that we had brought in, you know, Colin Sexton, Jetty Osman, and so um, just speaking to Kobe Altman, who's the general manager of the team, like, he just thought it wasn't fair for me to go through a rebuilding stage. He's like, you've accomplished so much. Like, we don't want to put you through a rebuilding stage. Now, if you want to be here or do you want to go somewhere where you can, you know, win championships and, 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 and do that for your coaching career. And so um, after talking to Kobe, which is great, you know, if a general manager comes and talk to you first about kind of how they see it and what you want to do, that made me feel good. But I thought, you know, me as a young coach, as a black coach, um, I think that I should be on a stage where we have a chance to win every year. Mm. And... Um, and so that's kind of like, it was kind of like a, a mutual decision, you know, but Kobe told me like, I don't want you to have to be here and go through a rebuilding process. And so I respect that. And so uh, when I got let go, six games into it, I probably needed it. You know what I mean? Wow. Like yeah. just talking to Phil Jackson, he said every three, four years, you should take a break. You know, if you're wow. good enough to take a break and come back, you should do that. Cause I mean, people understand how much goes into coaching. Like every time you lose a game, you going home, you can't sleep. You think about what could I have done different? Who could I played? Bad ATO. Like, it's just a lot of stuff that goes into it. And so it's a lot. Dealing with all the different egos and trying to manage 15 grown men who are rich. And like, it yeah. just, it's a lot, you know? And so people don't understand like how much goes into coaching. And just from a, from a standpoint, you're not sleeping at night. You're trying to prepare for the next day. Coach, and- y'all wear those games. Like, it, it's so different in football. We work all week for three hours. Right. And so we normally wear the losses and you're high about the wins because you know you're not playing until the next week. Right. If you go on a five game win streak or losing streak in football, it's actually a month and a half right. of you doing that. Right. With you guys, you could have a back to back or it could be a long road stretch. You actually wear those losses that way every as a coach? Game, every game, every game, you know, and it never stops and it's easy like, you know, our coaches are older, Brian Shaw and Larry Drew, like, man, you can't take it home. Like, man, what are you talking? Like, like, if we lose a game, I'm taking it home, and I'm not sleeping. And so we don't, if we don't get that next win, I'm going to sleep again, you know? And so um, it's just, it's a lot. And so, like, you give so much to the game, and you love the game, and you respect the game, and the game has given you everything. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to shortcut it. Like, yeah, losses hurt every, every night. <laughs> losses hurt. And sometimes even when you win, like last night we won, I didn't think we closed the game right, so I can't sleep because I'm thinking about how we can different ways we can close games. And so you hear all the people talking and all that, they don't understand. Like they can say what they want to say and speak on how they want to speak about any coach or whatever they want to say on Twitter. And I don't have social media, but like, I mean, not about me, just other coaches, but you don't understand what we got to actually go through every single day, you know, to try to put your team in position to win, you know, for one night. It's it's hard, like it's tough. And so that's why I feel sad. When you get a chance to take some time off, take some time off and kind of, rejuvenate yourself and try to come back, but it's a lot of sleepless nights. Coach, coach you will take a, a game on a Tuesday night and miss sleep. So from a head coaching perspective, Ryan brought it up. What happens when a LeBron leaves your team or a Kyrie? Like, we don't hear from a head coach perspective. We hear from the players. Right, right. We hear from the organization. <laughs> but you the dude that has to make this team good, and now LeBron, I'd put him number two. Jordan's going to be number one in my mind forever. <laughs> the second best player ever to touch the court, in my opinion, leaves your team after a championship. Like, how does your process go when your team changes that drastically? Well, I mean, I know it's a business, and you got to do what's best for you and your family. So I understand that, you know, 100%, you know. But 
things do change, you know, overnight. You know, when you have LeBron James leave your team, Kyrie Irving, especially when the team was built around y'all. Mm -hmm. And now when you leave, like, we, we had a team full of shooters that couldn't dribble. <laughs> like, so, so that, yeah, like Kyrie, you know, LeBron, they sent, you know, Kyle Corbin, Channing Fry, Richard Jefferson. Right. Like, we had a lot of guys that eat, but they couldn't cook. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so you know, it, it got tough. You yeah. know, so you try, you try to figure out different ways to, you know, manufacture wins, different ways, different styles of how to play. And, um, you know, it was tough. You know, yeah. it was tough. But I thought we did some good things in those six games. I thought we, in, in all six of those teams, I think, made the playoffs that year. You know, so it was a tough, it was tough, but I thought we enjoyed it. It challenged me in different ways as a coach. Um, but like I said, it wasn't a long time with only six games, but it yeah. changes everything when, like I said, LeBron James and Kyrie Irving leaves. What's that conversation like? Does LeBron come up to your office? Does Kyrie come to your office? Do you try to convince them to stay? Like well, the mean, personal side of it. You say with all your players, you're honest. Do your players give that same respect back to you? Yeah, but I mean, Kyrie got traded. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, we, I didn't want that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, like, that, that conversation is what I'm at. Like, it was something going yeah, on. We had it, we don't want, yeah, we don't want him to go. <laughs> Come on, man. Like, we had a well oiled machine. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, and then KD left, you know, Golden State. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I mean, it just, you know, no, you never want to see that happen. And so, you know, but like I said, it is, a, it is a business. You know, the franchise had to do what's best for the franchise. The player has to do what's best for the player. And so you understand those things, but you don't want to see it happen. You know, it, it hurts. It's, it's hard, but it's part of the business. You, you talk about players leaving. What about players coming? LeBron tweeted the other day that Bronny was better than the, the team, most of the players that he had been watching that, that night. How true is that? Capping. You think it can yes. I think Bronny's tough. Frederick, I mean, I don't know now. Frederick Taylor. <laughs> I don't know. Frederick I don't Taylor. Know. I'm be honest. Look, I, I, love, I love my child. Right, 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 right. But I'm not going to tweet. And Bron, you're my guy. <laughs> but I think it's that, awesome that you're a great father. We're, we're talking Bron. about. We are talking about bloodline, and we are talking about one of the greatest players ever. He's probably number one in my book, Shan. So that's the conversation. But listen, he knows his bloodline. Le, when LeBron came, I, I'm going to ask, ask the that, basketball. I mind. did ask the coach, and we'll get back. <laughs> but when LeBron came out to himself, that was true. He was better than majority of guys on the on the court as a high schooler. I could be wrong, but that's the way I saw it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you think about that comment? Well, for Bron, you know, when he came out, like like I said, he has the he had the longest run that I've seen. Somebody with the expectations of coming into the right. league and then surpassing yeah, those expectations yeah. and then staying on top for 20 years. He averaged 28 points a game at 38. Like yeah. so, like he's dealt with all the scrutiny, all the pressure, and he's exceeded all expectations. And then, like I said, Bronny is a, is a hell of a talent as well. And so, I mean, if you look at young teams and you look at, like, certain teams, like, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say as far off. Like, you know, Bronny, he could be on that level with some, some guys that are playing, you know, in the league, younger guys that are still trying to find their way. And so um, I wouldn't say, like, every player, all these players, but, I mean, like, he's a hell of a talent. And so I, I could see some comparisons to some of the young guys that's coming in the league that are 19, 20, 21 years old that's trying to find their way. Um, so I wouldn't say it was that far off. So if you guys had a, a, an opportunity in 24 and you're in the war room and Bronny's available, would y'all pull the trigger? I would like to. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. How old does that make you feel, though? You know, you, you're the point, <laughs> Coach. <laughs> coach, you go, you coach the dad. Now you might have an opportunity to coach your son or at the least coach against it. That says a ton about the longevity of Ty Lue, not just as... Uh, a player, but as a coach, I mean, you, I mean, you got your own street too. You know what I'm saying? And, and now, when you come from a small town, you got a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you come from Mexico, Missouri, man. Yeah, you got a lot of, a lot of different things, you know. So, and you are now a coach, and you're talking about managing those personalities when you're a player. And I was, and I was much like this, you know. When you do become a guy that that works hard, you understand your role and these different things. Sometimes the leadership position is hard, and I want to kind of oppose Channing in this. Whereas guys like Tibbs or the Van Gundys, they get this sort of level of respect because of the way people feel they've gone about getting their jobs, mm -hmm. right? And then when you become a head coach as a player, they sometimes look at your playing career as the level of respect they'll give you. Like, instead of instead of a guy being like, yeah, I know you play, they're like, yeah, you play, but you a role guy. Right. Ha is there ever any times where you feel like you may get pushback 
from some of the stars because you weren't necessarily that sort of player during your career? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, when you win a championship, I think you get stamp as being a you know being a pretty good coach and like I said I got a long way to go and I understand that I never stopped working I never stopped trying to figure out different things different ways to be better um, but like when you talk about Tibbs and Van Gundy and guys like that like yeah, they, they had a grind yeah like you started in the in the um, video yeah. room you might be an intern then you you know then you do the video then you chop and film you might go to coach a D3 like mm -hmm. yeah. so they had a grind and so I wouldn't say they would say like, oh, well, they're better. I would say like they have the experience, like because they've done it at every level. Like mm. Tibbs coaching, I don't know, I think D three or D right. high school, whatever. You, you did video, you did film, and so to get to where you want to get, you've been doing it a long time. Mm. Whereas me, you know, I came in and coached with Doc for a while, but then I got elevated, you know, to the head coach in Cleveland, like uh, a year and a half when I was there, you know, and so. Like, well, he's never done it before. Like, and like I said, I, truthfully, I didn't know if I could do it either. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? But it doesn't make you better one way or another. I just think their grind was different. And mm -hmm. so when you see the grind they had to make to get to where they want to get to, you're like, damn, that's a lot of work. Like, right. a lot of hard work. And it's not easy. And right. so, um, like, so the comparisons are, like, different. But, I, like, when you take the route they took, that's a lot of respect to those guys because, like, to stay with it and do everything they had to do to get to this point, it's a lot of work. How much truth is there to the story that before Frank Vogel was hired as the Lakers coach, you were in conversations to be uh, the head coach there as well? Yes. What happened? Like you had another opportunity to? I can't remember. Oh, you can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> My man was ready for that one. <laughs> I can't remember. I, I, I think when he texted me to ask me what we were going to talk about, I left that one out. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I can't remember, man. <laughs> you, you have an opportunity, and you follow Doc Rivers here in L.A., uh, Kawhi Leonard, uh, Paul George, you know, now Russell Westbrook. I um, believe you guys went to the conference finals, what was it, two years ago? Two years ago, uh, yeah. Against Phoenix. And there are those expectations, not only because you have won a championship, but you've shown the propensity to continue to build championship contending teams. Mm -hmm. How much pressure is it on you as a head coach when people from the outside looking in are saying, okay, you have these all-stars, these all-time greats, these future Hall of Famer, so the expectations is we're putting this team together to go win. Is that part of those sleepless nights, understanding that those expectations are heaped upon you guys now because of the roster? I wouldn't say that. I would just say, like, most of the sleepless nights are coming, like, like I said, when you lose games or when some of you drill for the last three years and we just <laughs> we, we just don't do it, you right. know? And so, um, like, what can I do different? Like, is there a different way of teaching it or showing it? But, like, things that we know we should do and, and should do every single night and you don't do it, then those, you know, those accumulate the uh, sleepless nights as well, you know? And so, man, like I said, coaching's hard. And, um, you know, you got to be the leader of the team, you know, no matter what. If you lose tough games, you know, I might not be able to sleep at night. I might be mad or pissed off. But when I come in the next day, I got to be smiling. I got to be vibrant. I got to be you know, into it and make sure these guys don't feel that, you know, that I'm down or, or mad about a game that we've just lost. And so, and when you're the leader of the team as well, you know, whether or not a player messes something up or I'm going to take the blame regardless. Mm -hmm. Like, that's just how I'm built. I know 100, 100 times over that that wasn't my fault, but I'm going to go to the media and be like, you know what? That was my fault. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And I know that it wasn't my fault, but I'm going to take the blame. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, that's what you should do. You look at where you are now in your career. You think back to Mexico, Missouri, and all of those things. When you're with your Uncle Jay and you're, you know, looking up to him, Globe Trotter. He, I saw he averaged a triple double in high school. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's absolutely crazy to me. Did you ever envision, Coach, that this would be your journey? Not at all. I mean, you always, you know, dream in the park about making it to the NBA, you know, taking care of your family. But my Uncle Jay, like, he taught me work at, the, at, a, at a young age, just seeing how he would go play one-on-0 full court by himself, go down to the park, play by himself, take me with him, you know, and just so I looked up to him and idolized him because, you know, you come from a small town, you don't, really, you don't have cable. We didn't have cable, so I ain't seeing the games or none of that. And a lot of TVs, a lot of games wasn't televised, you know, back then. So... All you know and all you see is when you go to the high school games and you see like the older guys playing, like those are the guys you look up to. And so 
um, you know, you're never in the park going, cutting that three, two, one, right. game winner, I'm the coach. Like, no, you're the player. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm the player. Like, you know what I'm saying? So um, it just, it's, it's just different coaching. Like, it's, it's just it's different, you yeah. know what I mean, for me, because you always want to be the player, you right. know. But he taught me a lot, man. And like I said, my Uncle Jay, who's been there for me every step of the way, and just, you know, he was hard on me. You know, I, I one time in high school, I had a quadruple double. And um, I'm how hyped. I'm like, man, that ain't nothing. That ain't, you want to go to Georgia Tech? Bobby Crimmins don't care about no 18 points, 16 assists. You got to score 40. You can't, I'm like, I tried a, triple, a quadruple double. Like, hasn't been done in the state of Missouri ever. Right. Like, and then the next night I had a triple double. That still ain't enough. Like, you got to, like, God. Like, like, what you want me to do? Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, like, he was, but it was, it was a tough love. Like, so I would never get complacent, you know, never think I was good enough. Like, always want to continue to keep working to prove them wrong. Like, and he, he, he kept me, he kept me that way. And so I really, I'm thankful for that, you know, so that, that was dope. Hey, Ty, I'm looking at your 2016 Cleveland Cavaliers championship photo right here. As a, as a coach, have you had an opportunity to envision President Biden bumping Barack, uh, President Obama out the way and him holding the 2023 championship jersey up. I Is haven't you? envisioned that, but now I am. Now that you say it. Maybe it's an opportunity. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's ever been done. What's that? To have a former President Obama and now his vice president back in the day, you would be right. able to win a championship under him being the, the new president. I don't think that's ever been I don't done. think so either. That would be dope. That would yeah. be dope. Yeah, super dope. You guys are six right now in the West, Yeah. You, but you're getting better. Getting you better. Tweet. Right. So well, you, can you foresee it? When I'm in the playoffs, I like my chances. I love it. And coach, you talk about how much your mentor and people raising you up and, and giving you a hard time about quadruple doubles. Right. You being a player, you knowing what these young guys are going through, do you have any, is, is there any indecisiveness about how involved you get with their off the court life? How much advice you give them, the oh, financial yeah. questions? You're in LA, bro, the right. partying, the girls. Yeah. Like, do you ever struggle with how involved you get there? I don't struggle. I think, you know, when you hear something or you see something, like you want to give these young guys as much advice as you can, yeah. you know. And so um, if if I didn't, I wouldn't be doing my job. And so I don't look at myself as like just a Clippers head coach. I look at myself as a young black man that can inspire a lot of black and brown kids around the world, you know. And so when you're going through tough times and we lost five in a row, like how are you going to handle it? Mm -hmm. You know, how, you know, what are you going to do? So for me, it's my job, like I said, to make sure I'm reaching out to just more than basketball players, more than just athletes. It's more about, you know, culture and, and different people that I can help and try to help advance as much as I can, even if you know them or not. You know, like seeing Tehran Lou from Mexico, Missouri, yeah. you know, running a billion dollar corporation, you know, through the help of Mr. Bomber. But like, yeah. I'm the head coach of a billion dollar corporation. You know, and so when you see that from a guy that's come from a small town, like you can inspire a lot of young black kids, a lot of brown kids and, you know, all kids around the board. And so that's kind of how I look at myself. No matter how tough things get, how hard things get, like it's, it's, it's bigger than me. You ain't getting no names. But did any of your players ever try to get over on you where you got to remind them, I've been a part of this? The guy comes in in the steam room 5 a.m., didn't want to breathe in your face, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. put the visine in his eye. Oh, yeah, you know, you yeah. got to remind yeah, him, bro, yeah, yeah. I know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, for hey. sure. Like, yeah, you see it every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see it all the time, but they know they can't pull it over on me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they know I know what's going on. You saying about just being not just the head coach of the Clippers, but being a black man who has been through this experience. We had Michael Beasley on the show. I guess it has to be almost a year now, mm -hmm. and it wasn't a dry eye at the shoot because he was just talking about the things he had been through in life, the adversity he'd come through and where he was now, you know, with young players that we're watching in the league that are young superstars who are now facing some of those adversities that maybe they weren't prepared for and having to deal with them. What would be your advice to kids that look like us that get an opportunity, whether they're 19, 20, to be drafted and now, same as you, you have now become the breadwinner. You have now to have to behave as the leader. What would be your life in making that adjustment and now going from boy to man? The dedication and respect for the game. Because you come into the NBA and the game gives you everything that you that you want, that you can never imagine or dream of, you know, for your family, for yourself, for your friends, and everything that you can like you can go on vacation to Paris, like if you don't yeah. make it to the NBA or the NFL. Like yeah. so things that the game is giving you, you gotta give it back. And that means, like, for me, 
only when I was with the Lakers because Shaq made us go out as young players the night before a game. But my 11-year career, I never went out the night before a game. Like, I just never did. I respected the game. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I respect the game too much. And so my thing is, like, just giving the game back what the game has given you. And so respect for the game. Put your work in every single day. Don't cheat the game. Don't cheat the process. And things will work out. And, it's, and the last thing is just being a good person. It don't hurt to be a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter how many tough days you have, we all have bad days, but you can always be a good person. And so um, sometimes it can be to a fault. You know, since December, I lost seven family members, you know, from Mexico. But we lost six games in a row, so I I can't leave my team behind. Like, And I know I should be there for my family, and it's been a tough time because my family wanted me there, and, and we're going through some tough times right now. But people don't even know this, but, like, seven family members since December, and I ain't go to one funeral because we lost five games in a row. like, right. And so like, well, I can take the easy way out and say, I'm gonna go home for a week or whatever, I'm gonna go. But I, I just felt like I couldn't do that. And sometimes you can get a game too much. Mm. You know, sometimes you can get a game too much where like family and stuff, like real life stuff matters, it's important. But I was just built different. Like, mm. if we had won five in a row, hell yeah, I went home for three of the funerals, three or four of them, you know? But when you're going through tough times, people wanna see how you react and kind of look at, are you trying to take the easy way out or are you trying to you know, do something different? And so, you know, just, it's just decisions you have to make. But my biggest thing for young kids is make sure you give the game back what it's given you. You don't have kids, you give the game so much. And just hearing you say that there's been seven people close to you past and you haven't gotten the opportunity to go to any of the funerals. Has basketball given you that much that you feel like you owe it all of that? Yes, 100%. Just look at the people from Mexico, how I grew up, and we call it one way in, no way out. If it wasn't basketball, I know what I would be doing, or I know where I'd be at, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, man, if it wasn't for this game, I definitely wouldn't be successful. In the right, the right, you know, light. Really? No, hell no. Like, you don't see, you don't see success every day in Mexico. You know, how, you, how do you measure success when you've never seen it? Mm. You know, like, so I'm in Mexico, 11,000 people, 1,100 black people, and I see the drugs, and I see the, this, like, what, what, what am I seeing that's, that's positive every day? You don't see positivity until you see people around you that are positive. Like, I don't want to be no school teacher. Like, you know what I'm saying? And nothing wrong with that. Like, but, like, you. growing up as a young black kid, like, I don't want to be a school teacher and deal with guys like me every day. Right. Like, I, I don't want that, you know? So you don't see that, you know, in Mexico. And so, man, the game's giving me everything. And so, like I told him every day, if God's saying, listen, I'm coming down in five seconds and you're done, I'm going to get on my knees and say thank you for everything. Like, I can't be mad, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I die out there on the court. That's what, I mean, that's what I love, and that's the game. But coach, you made it out of Mexico. You're yeah. not, you didn't become a school teacher. You went on to win multiple championships as a player and a coach. You've made it now, and you're still working hard as you did when you were in Mexico in high school. Like, bro, you hit the finish line. But I didn't. Yes, you did. For me, but I got other people to worry you, about. You're going basketball till you die? No. I'm gonna go basketball until I got enough money to sit back and say, you know what, <laughs> you know what, this is good enough. But yeah. like until, man, no. I got my grandma, my aunties, my uncles, my sisters, brothers, my mom. Like, no, I got too many responsibilities. Yeah. And when you come from a small town, you know everybody. And so you gotta take care of everybody in the best way you can, you know, without putting yourself out, okay. you know. And so, no, you got a lot of responsibility. And so if it was just me, I'd have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. I'd have been gone a long time ago, you know, but it's bigger than me, like I said earlier. In your journey to this date, what's been your greatest pivot in life? The point that, I guess, changed everything for you? That one moment? There's been a lot of moments, man. You know, I've been blessed and been lucky to really um, get out of a lot of situations that I, should, I don't know how I got out of. Mm. When I moved to Kansas City my sophomore year in high school and just seeing how my mom was crying because she didn't want me to go, um, I knew I had to make it worth it. Yeah. You know, I knew like, if I'm gonna leave my mom in Mexico, my sister's toy, my little brother, Greg, if I'm gonna leave and do this three year bid in Kansas City, <laughs> like it's gotta be worth it. You know what I mean? And so um, I never forget the look on her face when she was crying. And it was like, it's more like a family decision. Like we all sit down, like if we want to take this next step, if we want to get them, you know, seen by colleges and, you know, have a chance to play, like we got to make this move. And so, Seeing her cry the way she did and um, seeing how hard it was for me, I knew I had to make it worth it. And so that was I probably, that was my biggest pivot. Your family, everybody Chiefs fans? Chiefs and Rams. 
mm-hmm. because Mexico's oh, yeah, yeah right, Mexico's right. close to St. Louis. Right. Yeah, yeah, and then you know Kansas City. It's, it's both. It's like a split. You know, mm-hmm. everybody's like Chiefs and Rams. So well, you can be. It's everybody Chiefs now because it's the trendy thing. I mean, well, I was kind of sort. You got Patrick Mahomes, man. I check. Yeah. Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I always grew up a Rams fan. Well, was, first it was Cardinals. Right. Then they went to Arizona. Then right. it was the Rams. And then they took the team from St. Louis, and then so I always been a Rams fan. But mm-hmm. I cheer for the Chiefs as my second team, okay. you know, because it's Missouri. So right, right. Yeah. Well, well I'm gonna say this. From so one, two, coach, pull up the video. I was shooting earlier. Like, <laughs> I will. They got it in yeah, there. So, okay. so so pull up the video, coach. If you need, listen, I can do a ten day. I, I got six files to give, coach. Can you take care of the ball? I'm, Yo, don't really throw it to me like that. <laughs> you know, so my, my right. thought would be, my thought would be, don't give it to me unless you're ready to shoot. Unless it. I'm no, I could. You know, coach. All football players think they could hoop. In high school, I thought I could hoop until I got to college, <laughs> right? Because I wanted to stay champion. So I was like, yeah, and I went to play with the real basketball right. players. Then I realized I really couldn't hoop. But y'all super athletic, though. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, make yeah. <laughs> I make layups. Yeah. I make layups, coach. But when I was down there, man, they said that you are the funniest person in the building. That's what everybody said. So all I'm asking is the next Ty Lu 4th of July party in Mexico, Mexico, just invite the pivot. Man, are you serious? Invite the pivot, coach. Y'all are invited. There Y'all it is. Invite- <laughs> there it is, coach. Y'all are invited. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I like this. Oh, man. <laughs> Appreciate you, yes, coach. Sir, for sure. No, Thank you, coach. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate you, coach. I'm right, right, cool, brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, Cole, I stopped drinking, stopped smoking. Got on, remember Isometrics, the little drinks yeah, and yeah, shakes yeah. and all that shit? Got on that shit, lost like 20 pounds, was shredded up. Bitch, I couldn't make a play. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to hey, Zach. I went to Zach to Thomas. Routine, yeah. Zach Thomas. I said, Zach, man, this shit. <laughs> stretching and all. I said, man, I'm about to go out to these streets. Right. Said, well, do what you do what you got to do. And turn it off. Ball week, folks. Your routine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you stick to your routine. When I when I met Zach at the Super Bowl, that's the first thing he talked about. <laughs> said, oh yeah. yeah. He was he was like, man, thank you. He's like, I deal with Chan. I was like, that's my dog. And he's like, yeah, man, Chan. I tried to get him right, but. Them up. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get an acupuncture guy every Wednesday. For what? I'm, I'm gonna hit Tussies real quick. <laughs> and I'm gonna be seeing you in the Whatever morning. Whatever your routine is, make right. you play better. Appreciate you, know you coach. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cow, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a stomach cow, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up.